The Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura, California presents a homily by UCLA Oncology Chaplain Michael Esselin titled, What Matters? Recorded on Sunday morning, November 29th, 2020. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura. Our Reverend Dana Warsnap is away today I am Worship Associate Celia Ortenberg, and I'm joined today by Worship Associates Joe Hutchins and Amada Perez, and one of my very favorite speakers whom I will introduce you to in just a moment. I hope that you all had a nice Thanksgiving, and if it wasn't the usual Thanksgiving filled with in-person family and friends and laughter, I hope you all found uh, some time to Think about all of the things that you have to be thankful for. I am personally feeling very thankful today for being able to be here in one large community, even though we're far apart. So um, it's good to be here and it's good to be able to consider the important questions of life. I'm also very thankful to our tech team that works tirelessly every Sunday to do just that, to join us together. Here is the lineup of our entire team. Today, our director is Brian Fortune. Our assistant director is Kitty Merrill. And Joe Hutchins has created our magic images. Others will introduce themselves as they come on the screen. Now to our speaker, Michael Esselin. Mm -hmm. Michael Esselin serves as chaplain for the Sims Mann UCLA Center for Oncology. Two-time TEDx speaker, Michael speaks extensively to healthcare professionals, patient populations, and to faith communities across the country. He's also worked as an activist educator addressing anti-LGBTQ bias in the larger community. Michael was recently inducted into the UCLA Semmel Institute Eudaimonia Society in recognition of having lived a meaning-driven life. And just in case you haven't heard that term, eudaimonia, I've looked it up for you, for me too. It is the sustained happiness that comes from living a life rich in purpose and meaning. And Michael has certainly done that. Today, he will share reflections on the deep and important question, what matters? And if you want to hear more from Michael, he has four volumes of CDs available for purchase. Just contact him through his website, www. MichaelEsselin.com. Let us enter sacred space. Good morning. My name is Joe Hutchins. I hope everyone has a candle or chalice to join us in lighting our, our flame together today. As we come, in to come together in community in this virtual space, we are very aware of all that we have had to let go, not the least of which at the most basic level is coming into physical presence together. So we have that opportunity now to join in lighting our candles together As we light our candles, let us be mindful of the sacred time of coming together on our shared journey of discovery. Discovery of that which is indestructible within us and that on each day, each moment helps us grow. Good morning. As a call to worship, I'd like to offer the wisdom of Pema Chodron from her book, When Things Fall Apart. I used to have a sign pinned up on my wall that read, 
only to the extent that we expose ourselves over and over to annihilation can that which is indestructible be found in us. It was all about letting go of everything. Good morning. I'm Carolyn Bierke, the music director, and I'd like to invite you to sing with me a hymn that isn't as familiar to us called No Longer Forward Nor Behind. I will play it all the way through one time so you can hear the tune. Today, Michael Esselin will speak in the sermon to the question of what matters. What matters in our lives? And the story for the child and each of us today, the three questions also touches on this theme. The Three Questions by John J. Muth, based upon a story by Leo Tolstoy. There once was a boy named Nikolai, who sometimes felt uncertain about the right way to act. I want to be a good person, he told his friends, but I don't always know the best way to do that. If only I could find the answers to my three questions, Nikolai continued, then I would always know what to do. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? What is the right thing to do? The boy thought for a long while, but he didn't know the answers to his questions. Then an idea came to him. I know, he thought. I will ask Leo the turtle. He has lived a very long time. Surely he will know the answers I am looking for. So Nikolai hiked high up into the mountains where the old turtle lived all alone. When Nikolai arrived, he found Leo digging a garden. The turtle was old and digging was hard for him. I have three questions and I came to ask your help, Nikolai said. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? What is the right thing to do? Leo listened carefully, but he only smiled. Then he went on with his digging. Here, you must be tired, Nikolai said at last. Let me help you. The turtle gave him his shovel and thanked him. And because it was easier for a young boy to dig than it was for an old turtle, Nikolai kept on digging until all the rows were finished. 
But just as he finished, the wind blew wildly and rain burst from darkened clouds. As they moved towards the cottage for shelter, Nikolai suddenly heard a cry for help. Running down the path, he found a panda whose leg had been injured by a fallen tree. Carefully, Nikolai carried her into Leo's house and made a splint for her leg with a stick of bamboo. The storm raged on, banging the doors and windows. The panda woke up. Where am I, she said, and where is my child? Nikolai ran out of the cottage and down the path. The roar of the storm was deafening. Pushing against the howling wind and drenching rain, he ran further into the forest. There, he found the panda's child, cold and shivering on the ground. The little panda was wet and scared, but alive. Nikolai carried her inside and made her feel warm and dry. Then he laid her in her mother's arms. Leo smiled when he saw what the boy had done. The next morning, the sun was warm, birds sang, and all was well with the world. The panda's leg was healing nicely, and she thanked Nikolai for saving her and her baby from the storm. Nikolai felt great peace within himself. He had saved the panda and her child, but he also felt disappointed. He still had not found the answers to his three questions. So he asked Leo one more time. The old turtle looked at the boy. But your questions have been answered, he said. They have, asked the boy. Yesterday, if you had not stayed to help me dig my garden, you wouldn't have heard the panda's cries for help in the storm. Therefore, the most important time was the time you spent digging the garden. The most important one at that moment was me. And the most important thing to do was to help me with my garden. Later, when you found the injured panda, the most important time was the time you spent mending her leg and saving her child. The most important ones were the panda and her baby. And the most important thing was to take care of them and make them safe. Remember then that there is only one important time and that time is now. The most important one is always the one you are with. And the most important thing is to do good for the one who is standing at your side. For these, my dear boy, are the answers to what is the most important in the world. That is why we are here. Thank you for a lovely story, Joe. Those are the moments that make everyone know that we are still human while still on Zoom. Well, our offering today goes to Planned Parenthood to provide health care to those without insurance or other means to pay for the health care that they need. Rebecca tells this story about what Planned Parenthood's care meant in her life. In Rebecca's words, when I attended community college, I worked two minimum wage jobs, yet still was financially strapped and unable to afford health insurance. One day, as I was walking down the hall, I saw a flyer that said that Planned Parenthood was opening a health center in one of the classrooms. I visited the new conveniently located center and the rest is history. Because I was able to get preventative care, including birth control, I was able to fulfill my life goals to graduate college and become a mother. Access to birth control was absolutely crucial for me to be able to plan for my education and plan to have children when I would be able to afford to raise them. Because I could take charge of my life with affordable birth control, I was also able to transfer out of community college to UCLA and to attend Harvard Graduate School. 10 days after graduation, I gave birth to my son. I went on to a political career in Washington DC on Capitol Hill. I will forever 
be grateful for the affordable health care that I received from Planned Parenthood when I needed it. Thank you, everyone, for giving generously, as you always do. Good morning. I'm Worship Associate Amada Irma Perez, and this is my first time. And I'm honored to present our congregation's joys and sorrows. Each week, we lift up the joys and sorrows that have been shared with our community. You can submit your joy and or sorrow to be shared in one of two ways. Every Thursday, the email bulletin UUCV this week includes a link for sharing joys or sorrows. Or on our church website, you can use the drop down menu 
under Sunday services to find a link for joys and sorrows. When we are together in our physical sanctuary, we drop stones in water for each joy or sorrow. The ripples that go out remind us that we are all connected. Here in our virtual sanctuary, we make together today. I invite you now to speak the names aloud or in your heart, those you wish to celebrate or memorialize, or those who may need the loving embrace of the community. By invoking their names, even when we may not hear them, you bring them into this circle of caring that we call community. Marco, Nico, their children, their loved ones, and all our loved ones. We hold these names spoken and unspoken in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we be truly grateful for all that is our life. I invite us right now to move into a time of silent meditation and reflection that we might close our eyes and maybe take a few nice deep breaths together as we quiet our minds. We let go right now of the concerns of the day, the week behind us and the week ahead of us, and we simply follow the empty breath. We come back to that image of that place within us, the part of us which just may be indestructible. Whatever that place is, that essence is, we don't need to give it words. We simply breathe into it, that core of our being. From that place, we move into silence, in community. I invite you to join me in singing our next hymn, Just As Long As I Have Breath.
Our reading today is from The Painted Drum by Louise Erdrich. Life will break you. Nobody can protect you from that. And living alone won't either, for solitude will also break you with its yearning. You have to love. You have to feel. It is the reason you are here on earth. You are here to risk your heart. You are here to be swallowed up. And when it happens that you are broken or betrayed or left or hurt or death, death brushes near, let yourself sit by an apple tree and listen to the apples falling all around you in heaps, wasting their sweetness. Tell yourself you tasted as many as you could. Our special music is Time in a Bottle by Jim Croce. Good morning. In the time of the pandemic, it seems we are all deluged with dozens of unanswerable questions, each one competing for our all too limited attention and capacity to focus. How long is this gonna last? How am I gonna keep myself and my family safe? How are we going to make it financially? How do we live with this kind of uncertainty? As we vacillate between one question or another, whichever happens to be working us over at any particular moment, there might in fact be one question that lies beneath all the others. What matters? Last fall, as a part of the UCLA Centennial, I was invited on behalf of the UCLA Department of Arts and Architecture to be a presenter at their special 10 questions event, the Centennial edition. It's a series of 10 evenings, each one devoted to one particular question for our life and times, each one explored by a multidisciplinary panel. When I told my husband Scott about this honor of having been asked, he of course asked me, what's your question? 
What matters, I said. Oh, everything and nothing, he said, and then he left the room. Pithy, yes, but also true in a way. Everything matters and nothing matters. Our individual lives, such as they are in this moment, are in fact a culmination of countless decisions we have made over the course of our lives, both large and small, each one shaped and informed by our idea of what matters. Do I marry this person or not? Do I live in this city or not? Do I pursue this career or not? Or on a whole other scale, do I buy this new pair of shoes or save my money? Do I eat that last piece of chocolate cake or let it pass me by? On a national scale, we only have to look one year ago at our democratic presidential primary debates to get a cross section of what matters. Day one of my presidency will be addressing healthcare reform. No, for me, it's facing climate change. No, for me, it's cleaning up the corruption in Washington or addressing the catastrophe happening at our southern border. And it all matters. And yet look at what happened in the span of very few months indeed. All of that was trumped, you should pardon the expression, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Does that mean that none of that matters anymore? Of course not, it just means that this captures our attention right now. On a whole other scale, do you know what else matters? That you get home safely from your next outing to the supermarket, that we have enough cat food that Rupert has been fed, there, or that I have milk for my oatmeal tomorrow morning. I think ultimately what matters is the thing right in front of us this very moment. I remember in the early 80s reading a magazine interview with Rosalind Carter. This would have been not long after she and Jimmy had moved out of the White House back to their home in Plains, Georgia. At the time of the interview, she was busily engaged in laying a new brick pathway up to the front stoop of their house. She commented to the interviewer how astonishing it was to reflect that very few months earlier, she had been living in the White House, hosting state dinners, Camp David Peace Accord, all of that. And now the most important thing in the world is that this brick is straight. And it matters, she said. Though I was such a young man, I was struck by the profundity of that so much so that it still sticks with me nearly 40 years later. It's kind of Zen-like, isn't it? Around the same time, I remember taking some kind of self-development seminar or another, after all, it was the 80s, in which we were given the task of writing our own epitaph. Now, if you've never tried it, it can be a daunting task, but also illuminating. My mom died a year ago, April. There's only so much room on those little bronze plaques. Which few words are you going to choose to summarize, to encapsulate an entire human life? What I chose for myself in my 20s was he was moved by life. I think what matters ultimately is quite fluid and changeable over the course of a lifetime, maybe even over the course of an afternoon. What mattered to me at 25 is not what mattered to me at 45, which bears little resemblance to what matters to me at 65. I think in the first half of life, we're so consumed with accomplishing our goals, achieving something, acquiring success, as if we have the vaguest idea what that really means. Second half of life, I find, is a different story. But one inescapable truth for all but precious few of us is that a couple of generations from now, no one will know or remember or care that you even walk the earth. So given that reality, what matters? I have to come back to Rosalind Carter that the bricks are straight. And yes, while I'm focusing on this brick in front of me, I have to be mindful and attuned to all of these other enormous questions that plague our world. But when it comes time for me to breathe my last breath, what will I say matters then? In my role as an oncology chaplain, I would say I'm sort of in the coming out business. 
I'm creating a safe space for people to come out to me to tell me their truth, often their deepest truth, and often at the most significant time of their lives, at the end of it. But the way I see it, it's not only a coming out business, it's also a meaning making business because once that truth is out there on the table, how do we contain it? How do we hold it? How do we find meaning in it? That's part of the gift and exhilaration of getting to do this work. Every day I get that constant reminder, pay attention. Particularly as I move well into the third act of my life. When I reflect back on Acts 1 and 2, I realize how seldom it was that I was ever focused on the brick in front of me. I always had my eye around the corner to the next choice, the next decision. How does this affect that one, get me closer to where I want to go? Which class do I take? What do I major in? What career do I pursue? Which relationships do I nurture to get me closer to wherever it is I think I want to go? And of course, that's still kind of true in a way, but perhaps maybe with less urgency. But then again, maybe with even more urgency because at this stage in my life, the big what's next for me is the home stretch, the final reckoning. So when it comes time for me to breathe my last breath, what will I say matters then? There are, of course, as many answers to that question as there are people on the planet. And yet, I do hear common themes from folks who have to wrestle with that very question before signing up for guaranteed suffering with the next chemo, the next drug trial, the next surgery, the next radiation. What is it that makes my life worth fighting for? Well, I'd like to live long enough to see my son graduate high school or get married. I'd like to see my grandchildren be born. Still, I find those to be deceptively simple and tidy answers, seldom revealing the whole story. Many years ago, I worked on the inpatient bone marrow transplant unit at UCLA, leukemia and lymphoma patients mostly, who often spend many weeks, if not months, in the hospital. And there I met Leon, who was a very difficult, prickly guy, not at all likable. In all his weeks in the hospital, I never saw that he had a single visitor, and he was sort of proud of that. I don't need anybody, he would say. He had his own business, and he had a dog who scared the neighbors. Leon identified as an atheist, a secular Jew. He presumed I was religious and a Christian, neither of which are true. But he used to enjoy duking it out with me, philosophically speaking. That was the nature of my spiritual care. We would engage in these deep theological discussions. Once he got his bone marrow transplant, things went south very quickly. And the doctors came in with that awful news. Nothing more we can do, Leon. Well, then his heart began to soften and the tears came. But the very next day, the docs came in and said, wait, we think you just might qualify for this brand new drug trial. His spirits went through the roof, mine too. Leon, this is great news. Tell me, what will you do with more time if you get it? I eagerly wanted to know. I'd like to finish my invoicing, he said. My heart just sank. In total judgment, I admit, I was not a good chaplain in that moment. I did not ask the next obvious question. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. Why are your invoices so important to you? No, I just kind of sat there in stunned silence. I guess I was hoping he would say, I'd like to walk my dog on the beach one more time. I'd like to see one more beautiful sunset. I'd like to hear Rhapsody in Blue one more time. No. I'd like to finish my invoicing. That's where he found his meaning. That's what mattered. Mary Ann, in her mid 40s, had been living the previous several years with pancreatic cancer, and I walked the last few months of her journey by her side. Not long before she died, I went to see her in the hospital, and she was hooked up to every tube and pump and hose imaginable, absolutely fried, just cooked. Michael, I'm done, I'm ready to let go, this is it. But it wasn't an option. Her husband and her kids, of course, wanted her to keep 
fighting. Try the next drug trial. Let's have the next surgery. Let's get a second opinion, a third opinion, a fifth opinion. I can't die, she said, having them think for the rest of their lives that I didn't love them enough to keep fighting. Do you think that's what they're going to think of me? What would you like, Marianne, if you could call the shots right now? Oh, that's easy. I would disconnect all of this. I'd ask my husband to get in bed with me and hold me and look out that window across the room at that tree across the street and say, look at the leaves on that tree. Look how they capture the light and flutter in the breeze. Isn't that beautiful? A God moment, she would call it. In our months of conversation, she had told me about other God moments, moments that anchored her into life, moments in which not much really happened, in which the stuff and business of life just fell away, leaving space for an awareness that this moment, as it is, is enough and it's beautiful. I'd like one more God moment she said. I met Evelyn on her first day of chemotherapy after being newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She came to see me regularly every couple of weeks for the next six years, though she never wanted to talk about anything of any greater consequence than what she and her husband Jean had done the previous weekend. Despite all my invitation, holding the door open to talk about the deeper themes and questions that are coming down the pike, she never took the bait. I didn't feel like I was doing much of anything, but she concluded each visit by thanking me. Michael, thank you so much. I always feel so much better just talking to you. I went to see her in the hospital the day before she died. Her husband, Jean, was there, of course. They'd been married just forever. No kids, though. High school sweethearts. The Buddhists believe it's a good idea to be reflecting on the sweet memories of life before one makes their transition that maybe it greases the wheels for the next incarnation. No matter what our beliefs are about such things, it's not a bad idea. So I asked Jean, tell me that story again about how you guys met. I love that story. And he launched into the story, and Evelyn was getting a little irritated. She didn't remember. Undaunted, Jean pressed on. Sure you do, honey. Remember we were going to that football game, and we were in the back seat of that car? No. The memory was gone forever. Jean changed course. Oh, that's okay, honey. I think you're maybe just tired. Tell you what, Michael and I will go out in the hall and chat a little bit, give you a chance to rest. How about that? No, she said defiantly, I don't want to rest. I want you both here. I just don't want anybody to talk. And so I sat on one edge of the bed and Jean sat on the other edge of the bed and we each held a hand and we just looked at one another. Absolutely nothing to say, nothing to do, just space and love and awareness for the rest of my life. That scene has imprinted my heart with an image of what truly sacred space looks like. Perhaps what really matters most is what's left when everything that we thought mattered so much has burnt away. So what matters to me today in this moment? This conversation really matters. Kindness really matters. Friendship, love, of course, humor. Being a witness to one another in our lives such as they are. Communion, it's an old fashioned religious word, but I love it. The imagery of it, taking in and digesting our common humanity that which binds us to each other and to nature and to the source of life. That matters. Sure, I'd like to think when I'm breathing my last breath that I'll be reflecting that I made a difference, that I relieved some suffering, I provided some encouragement maybe. 
that I had a blast, that I saw the world that I loved really hard, but I'm not so grandiose as to think it was ever anything more than one conversation at a time, one brick at a time. We go through life having countless interactions with others, maybe sharing a little encouragement here, passing the time there. Those experiences might have the farthest reaching impact of anything we ever do. They may be our greatest legacy. Joseph Campbell believes we should try to realize the eternal within, to participate with joy in the sorrows of the world. I come back to that again and again as a kind of mantra to participate with joy in the sorrows of the world. I don't know. Maybe it just comes down to being moved by life. So be it. Let's take three breaths together. So these blessings of us being together, let us join together in song. Come sing a song with me. As we extinguish our chalices today, let us be mindful of what and who is important at this time, at this very moment. In a moment, you'll be placed in breakout rooms for a virtual coffee hour. Even if you are new to us, I sincerely invite you in to join us. You can join, our, join your group or opt out at that point. 
If you want to continue chatting after your room is done, return to the main room and ask to be put into a new breakout room. I invite you to perhaps close your eyes and take a few nice deep breaths with me now. Breathing in the love, the intention, the commitment of this community to come together and to connect despite all that there is now to separate us physically. As we exhale, can we release the light and the radiance of our coming together, not only back to one another, but to the larger circles of life. Let's even stretch our arms out right now where you are sitting and just imagine embracing each other and those larger circles of life, getting a sense of our connectedness in a place beyond time and space. Despite the physical isolation of this moment, as we breathe into that embrace, let's absorb the words of the poet Rilke as a blessing to ourselves. Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart Try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books written in a very foreign tongue. Do not seek the answers which cannot be given to you because you would not be able to live them. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. So be it. We hope you've enjoyed listening to What Matters with Michael Esselin, recorded on November 29, 2020, for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura, California.